morning everyone. Uh, my name is Suril Rajmendra and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Toronto in Italy. So today I will be giving a brief uh, presentation on our work on statistical evaluation of cutting properties of LPPR cellular material using strain energy density approach. Right? We have all seen, let me start with what are cellular materials. They are porous materials made of either repeating lattice structures or foam based topology and in recent years they have shown an increase in trend to be used and this is due to their advantages such as high strength to weight ratio, favorable mechanical properties, good energy absorption and with the development of AM process the ability to be manufactured using different materials and topologies in the same component. Like we saw before, some of the disadvantages from the combination of the additive manufacturing process and the lattice or cellular material is the uh, surface roughness, internal porosity and geometrical deviation which, are, which influence their mechanical performance. Along with these defects, the other parameters which influence the performance are the material type, cell topology and the AM process parameters itself. Moving on to the study that we conducted, we start with a cubic cell topology made of titanium 6,4 and using manufactured using LPBF process with parameters of core diameter between 15 to 45 and layer thickness of 60 microns. These specimens were then heat treated at temperatures greater than 800 for phase transformation. As you can see, the specimens are designed in three different sections. The first, the first one being the region of interest and having transition end the ends and the flange and the bell shaped flange to perform the fatigue test. So there were two types of specimens that were considered, filleted and unfilleted specimens to see the effects of fillets or the notches in these in their fatigue behavior. And the desired parameters that we would expect from these specimens from the manufacturing process are shown here. However, since we know that there will be a geometrical deviation, we had to change the thickness values or compensate the thickness of the given CAD model to a certain extent to have the desired values after the printing process is done. And this is one of the main points that in the region of interest, we have close to 776 junctions or notches or notches like these which have an influence on the printing performance or in this particular study. So what are the different methods that are adopted in this? First one is the mechanical test of those specimens under compression and fatigue. We do the compression test to obtain their static properties such as inch modulus and heat strength and the fatigue test is carried out in fully reverse cycles in this case and not on the usual compression compression fatigue because most of the components under real life undergo tensile fatigue, tensile uh, stress as well. So we have considered fully reverse cycles in this case. So once we do the fatigue test, a part of the specimen is subjected to CT scan using MCT 225 with a spot size of 3 microns and the surface is reconstructed with a voxel size of 9.5 microns. From the CT scan, we not only obtain the surface morphology but we also obtain the internal porosity which induces or which is an important factor in the fatigue performance. And the final part of the study is the finite element analysis which is divided into three stages. First one is the interaction of the bell shaped flange and the region of interest. Second one is the creation of a complete B model of the region of interest. And the third part is creation of a solid model of the region of interest to have a detailed analysis on, their, uh, on the stress distribution in them. And finally, since we scan only a part of the specimen to estimate the overall behavior, we extrapolate it using the extreme value theorem. Coming to the mechanical test results, here you can see clearly see the difference between the fatigue curves or the filleted and unfilleted. A clear increase in the fatigue strength is seen. But in this study, we consider not only the fatigue strength but the fatigue notch factor value Kf, which is the ratio of the fatigue strength of the bulk material and fatigue strength of the cellular material. So, in order to get the fatigue strength of the bulk material, we had to produce some more. Uh, bulk specimens using the same manufacturing process and tested and then we obtain the ratio Kf which is 149 for the unfilleted and 86 for the filleted. So with the, uh, with the presence of fillets we see almost a 40% decrease in the fatigue notch factor in these specimens. 
Moving on to the finite element modeling, in the first stage, like I said, it is the interaction between the bell-shaped flange and the region of interest. And for this, we consider only one egg of the specimen, apply symmetric boundary conditions, and then even the bolts are modeled as beams in this case to uh, uh, represent the actual loading conditions from the machine, and loads are applied on the bottom of the flange. So, after the loads are applied, we obtain the forces or extract the forces in the region of interest that is on the top and the bottom of the region of interest and these forces which are extracted are considered in the next stage of the finite element modeling. In the next stage, we create beam models which are easy to solve and computationally very easy to handle. So, to create the beam models, we have to obtain the geometry of the actual specimen. So for this, we start from the point cloud, extract the data in all the struts and create sampling planes. From these sampling planes, we fit an ellipse on the sampling plane or the point cloud and obtain the geometrical parameters of the ellipse. These geometrical parameters are used as input to create beam models. Since we have only a part of the specimen that is scanned, we vary the geometrical parameters or use different combinations of geometrical parameters and create 15 different models of the region of interest like this using the variation. So, there are 15 models of beam and the loads that you see on top and bottom are the ones extracted from the previous slides. And in, from the beam models, we extract the boundary conditions for the next stage of the solid model. One more factor that has to be considered is the presence of fillets. Here you can see that we don't see any fillets that we had seen in the specimens. So, for this case, we use a multiplication factor for the strut thickness of the beam model in order to match the stiffness values. So for filleted, we increase the strut thickness by a factor of 1.2 in order to match the experimental and the beam model stiffness in these materials. Whatever force or the displacements that are extracted from the beam model will be used in the next stage of the solid model. In this case, we again go to the point cloud, extract a unit cell create a detailed FE model and here we use transition mesh in order to reduce the number of elements that are there and in this case the element size varies from 0 0.04 on the surface to 0.12 on the uh, inside of the specimen. With the element size of 0 0.04 it is almost 4 times the voxel size therefore we, we can actually see that most of the surface defects or the surface morphology has been captured in this unit cells. So whatever loads that are applied to these on the six different phases are the ones that are obtained or extracted from the beam model. So we don't extract the loads only in one location. So as I mentioned, there were 15 different beam models and we extract loads in four different locations. So there, that is 60 loads that are extracted and 60 in tensile and 60 in compression. So, a total of 120 B models, uh, loads from the B models are extracted and it has been applied on 24 and 17 unit cells leading to close to 2000 to 3000 simulations that are carried out on, in the total study. So, this gives a statistically considerably amount of data in order to make sure that the study or the methodology developed is efficient. Once we have the FE analysis, how do we calculate the fatigue notch factor? We use the strain energy density method and the fatigue notch factor Kf is the ratio of the strain energy density of the local or near the maximum stress location to that of the nominal strain energy density. And we use the strain energy density approach because this is slightly independent and of the mesh size which gives us certain freedom to use a slightly coarser mesh compared to a local stress based approach. So, whatever strain energy density we calculate is dependent on the internal porosity of the specimen as well. From the CT scan, we obtain that the average diameters are close to 60 microns and when we take the square root of area, it is close to 50 microns. And when this is plotted with, for SLM specimens from the literature, we see that the strain energy density has to be calculated over a volume of 0.1. So, from the literature and the combination, we decide the volume over which the strain energy density has to be calculated. And since I have told that the number of junctions in the specimen is close to 800 and we 
use the FE analysis only on 24 or 17 junctions, we had to extrapolate the data somehow in order to get the maxima at 99 and 99.9% per probability and we, that, we do that using generalized extreme value theory. How does it work? So we obtain the KF values for the 15, for example, for one location and one junction in 15 different locations. We fit the data, we calculate the value at 99% and 99.9% .9 probability. So this prediction is done in two stages. In the first stage, we consider only the 15 simulations for each unit cell and average it over the different locations. And in the next stage, we consider all the values of the KF and obtain the value of B at two different maxima. And for that, we consider more or less 1000 to 1400 values. Moving on to the results, for the unfiltered specimens, you can see that the maximum stress location is near the junctions as expected. And the KF values that are predicted are vary between uh, in this case 110 to 180 in the distribution but when we average these values yes. when we average these values for different locations we see that the KF is uh, considering the standard deviation is more or less close to the experimental uh, data and we also see a trend with respect to the type of loading. We see that in tensile for location 1, the maximum KF is obtained by for compression it is for location 3. And when we obtain the KF value or the fitting mass factor irrespective of the locations and junctions, for 99.9% .9 probability, the percentage of error is less than 5% and for 99% probability is less than 15%. When we look at the results of the filleted specimens, you can see that the uh, petty uh, maximum stress location has slightly moved to a place where the strut finishes and the fillet starts and the obtained KF values are varying between 70, 70 and 95 in this case. Here you can see the predicted values are 68 because the total number of unit cells that were used was lesser and or close to 17 unit cells compared to the 24 of the previous one. And when we average the KF values, KF values, we see a similar trend and the values of 99.9% .9 probability are very close to the experimental predicted values and the trend of tensile and compression is similar to what we, to what we have seen. And when we predict the KF values irrespective of the location, they are in line with the experimental and the percentage of error is less than is less than 3% and for 99.9% .9 and less than 13% for 99% uh, predictions. To conclude, the methodology that we develop is to calculate the fatigue notch factor is based on strain air density and extreme value theory and it uses three different types of FE modeling and the values of KF that are obtained, we can see that the fillet has a higher influence on the fatigue notch factor and the value of KF not only depends on the location in the entire specimen but also on the type of loading that is applied. To finally conclude, this methodology scans or uses only a portion of the specimen and smaller unit cells or smaller solid models, thereby reducing the computational requirement of doing the FA analysis on a complete specimen or the requirement to scan a whole specimen in this case. In the future, we would like to apply this methodology for other topologies and components which have different types of topologies on them. Thank you very much. So uh, clearly, uh, you have introduced uh, the city data only concerning the external geometry, 
Yes. So, but we all do know, and it was presented there yes. that there are also internal defects. Yes. So, so just and you've done quite a lot of so just adjustment of the thickness of the stiffness, which is which is fine for the field. But so just could you please uh, just give us an idea? Have, are you planning to incorporate the the effect of the internal defects? Or yes, actually, in this study we uh, take the internal defect into consideration when we. when we calculate the strain energy density in the finite element models. So, here you can see this is the distribution of the internal core diameter and uh, depending on the core size or the square root area of the defect, the critical radius over which the strain energy density is calculated is varied. So, in this case it was close to 50 microns, so it was 0.1. Maybe with another machine and better processing parameters, it might be good or even worse. So depending on that, we obtain the calculate the overall of the average strain in the sense. So I might ask, uh, the, another question. You've done quite a lot of the different simulations. Yes. So just so generally, you were looking at the spread, but uh, can we go to your so just uh, the uh, finished one? Yeah. So the CG, the image of the model. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, this is the point. But I was looking at this. So, yeah, this is the fact of the manufacturing. Yes. That this defect. And clearly, so just when you load it this vertically, this doesn't uh, so just incorporate. But if suddenly there will be the lateral loading, then clearly there will be significant stress. Raising this factor. So, just have, so just have so, you seen uh, this in your models? Uh, in our models, in, in this case, for this, we need some amount of experimental data that has to be conducted initially. So, in this particular study, the segments were loaded only in the vertical direction, but we also have the fatigue data of the loading in the horizontal direction. Mm -hmm. But in order to do the finite element analysis of that, we had to create uh, an initial CAD model for which we take the one of the model and we have to create the CAD model in such a way that these defects are somewhat considered in it with the maybe by decreasing the overall step thickness in the initial CAD model itself. But right now I am working on them and uh, we see that the scatter that we obtained in, by loading the struts in this direction is quite high compared to what we have seen in the vertically printed. So at this moment what I can say is with horizontally printed uh, struts, it is possible to predict but the scatter is pretty high in this case. Uh, I can give you an example of the actual experimental data for the filleted specimens which were printed vertically and tested vertically, the fatigue mass factor is 86 and for the same filleted specimens which are printed, with, which are loaded in the horizontal struts, the fatigue mass factor is 450. So, yeah, quite, a lot. quite a lot. And since we know that the in the horizontal the printing is not exactly uniform, we considering only a small portion of this study might increase the scatter in that case. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have one practical question. How do you use the samples for enzymes? Ah, yes. So, this to the loading plates of the machine using we created our own fixture which is feasible and uh, we hold these flanges to the loading and it is subjected to resonating fatigue testing mm -hmm. removal fatigue testing machine. So you have used fully invest pump? Yes, fully yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, one of the main reasons being usually cubic cellular materials they do not fail that easily under compression compression loading and uh, not only biomedical, but in if we take a wide range of applications at one or the other point of time, any component would undergo tensile as well. So the FE analysis is calculated separately for tensile and separately for compression. While when we do the test, it undergoes. Thank you very much for your presentation.